Hey guys, welcome back to another Unreal Engine tutorial. And this one, I thought we would delve a little bit into the theory of the engine, a little bit of the, the nuts and bolts that hold the whole thing together. Uh, as you might see over in world settings, over on the right, we have a game mode drop down window, which is a game mode override, and then a series of classes here, which are set by the game mode. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Well, that and a couple of other things, sort of the, the shared game objects and also the player specific objects per level, per instance of the game that you're running. Now, the first thing to consider when it comes to the game mode of your game is not this little drop down here in world settings. This is more for the editor's benefit, where in fact, if we go to edit and then project settings down here, which uh, I've already got open, and then we click on the maps and modes um, um, section under the project header, we see here the, uh, the sort of default settings for when you've packaged up and the first time you open up your game, it executes these things. We have the editor startup map, which is my little uh, tutorial map here and also the game default map. So this is the one that will be loaded, you know, when you, when you open up the game. And then at the top here, we have our default game mode, which by default is just set to this base game mode object, which we can't affect here. It just has the, the default empty uh, pawns and controllers, etc. But if we change this to something, for example, I have here the third person game mode, we can overwrite these things uh, in these little drop downs. So without further ado, uh, let's get into the technicals. So down the bottom of this page here, we have a game instance class. The, the game instance is an object that's spawned when you launch the application. That's the, it's one of the first objects that's spawned that's actually game related. And it remains the exact same object until you close the application. So this has uh, certain benefits. Uh, the most common usage for this class is to preserve player specific data so that you don't lose anything if you transition between uh, levels of the game. Because each level is going to have a different game mode. But the game instance persists until you close the game. So that's the one thing we have to keep in mind there. And in fact, we can make all of these objects as we go. So uh, down here, uh, let's just right click, make ourselves a new blueprint class. What we want is a game instance. So if we search here for instance, actually let's search for game instance. There we go. And we click uh, game instance here, not platform game instance, not the object above it, but game instance. And then select, we have our own uh, game instance. So we'll call it game instance. And we can open it up and see what all the fuss is about. And really, there's nothing to it. It's just an event graph. Uh, we can execute some uh, some code here. It'll be slightly different uh, unless you do actually have some variables that you want to store for the player between levels, you know, currency or, or health, uh, that kind of thing. If your game demands it, then that's what you can do. And, um, well, there we go. So the, that's the game instance for you. And now from here on out... Um, there, there, are, there are other things to consider. For example, if you're making a single player game, a lot of this uh, is totally unnecessary to you. You can just keep all of your variables in the player controller. You don't have to replicate any events and uh, things get a whole lot simpler. But for multiplayer, there are a lot of different things that we have to consider. And the next one is the game mode. So if we right click here and open up the blueprint class, we can make the game mode itself. Now I just checked, in fact, we'll do that again. So I just checked game mode base, which as we can see here in the hover over text, uh, governs the game rules scoring what actors allowed to exist in the game only instance on the server never exists on the client which is handy too because this has uh, or can contain sort of shared variables that the game relies on that all the players have to be aware of but primarily uh, let's just uh, get everything together here I'll call this game mode the game mode's main purpose is to handle how players join the game and how they're set up for gameplay. So when a game is launched, the game mode is one of the first classes that gets executed when a level is loaded. And as such, the game mode is used to set your game's default classes such as the pawn, the controller, the spectator, the game state, the player state, and uh, the heart. Basically all these things on the right here that we talked about earlier. Other code and variables can be stored in the game mode because it can be accessed by any player via the player controller or the player pawn or really uh, any other object uh, that we need to. If we want to think about it in terms of a stack with the game instance at the top as the first thing that's made, the game mode is the next thing that's loaded after the level itself has begun to load. Like once things begin to get set up, uh, the game mode is the next in line. So what I've done in the past in some smaller projects of mine is use the game mode. I sort of have a have a startup map which has your uh, you know your main menu and and that kind of thing. And then when you load the level. Uh, the game mode picks your or grabs your controller and spawns your pawn for you at a predetermined uh, starting point. The next thing in line is the game state. So if we right click here, make ourselves a new uh, blueprint and what we want is the game state. We can grab a game state base. So we'll hit select, call this game state. 
So the game state keeps class. In fact, we'll, we'll open this up because we can see that there is actually a viewport here. Although uh, I've never really had to use this, so I'm not sure why it's uh, why it's included. I'm sure there's someone out there who knows a bit more about this than I do, but it's here in the event graph that we really want to be focusing because we can execute some state uh, specific uh, things here. For example, the primary function has been to store uh, like timers and uh, like team scores, that kind of thing. Sort of, uh, if you want to think about it like anything you wouldn't ordinarily keep in a game mode, where the game mode might be, um, might, all it had to do was just sort of set up the conditions of the game and then its work is done. The game state is responsible to the, for the sort of moment to moment happenings, the, the real time in game calculations. So that's the function of the game state. It, it keeps track of the data relative to the current state of the game, such as, you know, timers and scores, like I mentioned, that all of the players need to know about in real time. Uh, you can also use this to handle scripted events related to the game, such as your pre-game readout, your team selection, post-game, and uh, other gameplay states that might affect all players, you know, timeouts or, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. So we can close these down as we go, I think, and move on to the next one, which is the player controller. So let's right-click here, make a new blueprint class, make it a player controller, and it's in this first uh, drop-down list here, and let's call it... If I can spell player controller. So this is the first uh, player or client specific object that uh, the, the, the concerns well, the, the player directly. Every input that you make uh, goes through the player controller to get to the, the player pawn that you might currently be using. But don't let, uh, don't let this um, uh, like confuse you into thinking that you need to put all of your um, or you know, all your button pushes and, and your inputs in this class. Think of it. Uh, a good example is Grand Theft Auto, where uh, you will have like one pawn, which is you on the ground walking around, and you might get into a car, in which case you need to be in a driving pawn uh, to sort to get the the vehicle controls. The basic inputs on the keyboard remain the same, but you're in two different pawns, and that would be uh, an example of putting your your inputs and that kind of thing in the player controller. Alternatively. Uh, you can leave the player controller empty and just use, uh, you know, different pawns and only use the player controller to possess those pawns. Uh, so that kind of, uh, I think that explains the player controller. It handles all the player inputs to be sent to the player's currently possessed pawn in real time. All the player inputs, uh, such as your buttons and your mouse movements, can be handled inside it. But if the game has multiple possible pawns to possess and control, then you might want to keep some of that functionality pawn specific. But either way, it's the player controller that possesses that pawn so that you can interact with the game world while it's running. Next, uh, as if we didn't just talk about it enough, is the player pawn. So if we go blueprint class, uh, we can make the player pawn. This is just an object that can be possessed by the character, basically, and uh, interacted with uh, to represent the player inside the game. So call this one player pawn. So a uh, player pawn is an actor that the player controller can possess once the level's loaded. And uh, it, it's, a, it's an actor in the level that the player can, well, perform actions with. By default, this uh, pawn class here, if we open it up, there is nothing in it. While we can possess it, there's really nothing to it. There's no camera, you know, uh, there's, there's no mesh, there's just nothing. But if we right click uh, here in the gray space, go back to blueprint class, we can also pick a character, which is a type of a pawn but it includes um, some some very, very basic movement. So if we spawn one of those, call a player character, open it up, we can see here that it's still pretty cut down, but we have this inherited character movement component. We have a spot for a mesh if we wanted to put one in, and we have an arrow there just to tell us which way is forward, and it's all parented to a, a convenient sort of collision. Now, while there's still no camera, this is enough at least to get you up and moving. Of course, it's all very, very, very cut down. Uh, you're obviously going to be wanting to you know, put more and more um, sort of functionality in there because by default, like if you can't find a camera, it's just going to use, I think it's the spectator pawn camera will create you just an empty pawn with a camera in it uh, that, that won't get you far. Or maybe it might just spawn a camera at zero, zero, zero and you'll just be looking at a sort of cross section of the horizon. Either way, uh, the pawn or, or, or the character, whichever one you find more suitable, uh, is going to need to be fleshed out sort of uh, by you. Next up is the player state. If we right click and go to blueprint class, we can make ourselves a player state. Player state. There's only one object, so we we'll click that, hit select. Uh, let's just call this player state. The main function of the player state is anything related to your to your, your player, your character, your role in the game that's not related to the pawn or the player controller 
but also needs to be known by all players, such as your name, uh, the score you currently have, sort of any other little um, little point of relevance like that. The idea is that it's data, like, I mean, every player in the server is going to get a player state, but every player in the server can see your player state. For example, if we open it up, uh, okay, so sometimes you might see this. Uh, it says this is data only blueprint, only the default values are shown, doesn't have any script or variables. If you want to add some, open the full blueprint editor. Just click this blue text here and we'll get our uh, sort of more familiar, you know, blueprint graph look. But those defaults that it was talking about up here, uh, well, we have the initial value. We have the class settings if we want to change those. And here are the, the default values. They'll appear over here in the details panel, uh, wherever on your window you've got that set. One notable thing about the player state is if we right click, type in player ID, you'll see that there are certain things, including this particular variable, that are built into some of these objects. And I've only very lightly touched on, on them, but the, the player ID is one that's definitely worth noting. In fact, the little double ball here in the top corner means it's a replicated value. I mean, of course, this whole uh, object is replicated, but this player ID uh, is generated by the player state and gives you a unique identifier within the game. So something you can call on on a player by player basis and uh, you know perform things specific to just to just one player at a time if that's what you want to do. So we'll compile that, I guess, uh, close it. The next object that we'll talk about is the HUD class. So if we make ourselves a new blueprint, we want this to be a HUD. If uh, you watched my most recent crosshair video, you're probably fairly familiar with with the HUD class and what it's for and what it's used for. It was traditionally used for generating text and images on screen using exact pixel offsets. But since the, the modern way of doing UI was introduced, the new UMG method, the class is mainly used to just generate UMG widgets. Or uh, I tend to use it as a convenient place just to store player related variables and parameters. It's attached to the player controller, not the player pawn. So no matter what pawn you've got possessed, you can probably still access the, uh, the HUD, you know, unless there's some other trickery going on. But yeah, I tend to use it as, a, as an intermediary between pawn and controller and uh, the actual, you know, HUD widgets. Because the controller runs the HUD, you can access it via your pawn or, um, you know, call on your HUD via the player controller. The, you, you can sort of handle your, your, your player in, in that kind of way using the, uh, the HUD or the controller as a place to store variables that you might need, you know, throughout the length of, a, of an entire game. If you might be switching between pawns, like a pre-game pawn, it's just a camera that looks at the background while you wait to wait, wait for people to join, that kind of thing. Anyway, the uh, last uh, one of these objects that I'll talk about is the spectator class. So if we uh, hit blueprint here, you'll notice that if we type in spectator, we have a default spectator pawn. So let's click that, select it, and we'll call this spectator. And let's open that up. So the spectator, it, it's really just a player pawn. Uh, it comes built in with just a very simple movement component and this little ball sphere here. It's just a mobile uh, sort of fly around camera pawn. Uh, very, very simple. But the reason it's here, the reason it has its own uh, its own sort of unique uh, identifier, its own parent class, is because you notice over here, it's part of the game mode. And you can set your player controller to either be you know, active, inactive, or spectating. And as long as the player controller is spectating, it'll be using your spectator pawn, your little fly around pawn. And you should be able to transition between these two fairly simply. I don't think people really, uh, well, I, I can't speak on behalf of anyone else, but in any projects I've worked on, we've never really used spectator pawns. Uh, we've always just sort of had a sort of a different, uh, like handmade pawn, just, just for convenience to relate to the same, you know, the same sort of environment. But it's just there if you want to use it. And before we wrap up, there is one other blueprint that I'd like to give special mention to. And that's if we look up here at our, uh, top row and find list of world blueprints. We'll see here that we have a level blueprint. Every single level gets a level blueprint. And uh, you might not use this much in multiplayer because you have other sort of shared objects because here in the level blueprint, uh, each player has a different instance of it. So um, you still need to be wary of replicated variables, replicated events, that kind of thing. But for single player, this is where you might want to be putting a lot of your you know, world-based um, your world-based sort of game triggers, your game mechanics. Uh, as an example of what the level blueprint can do is that it can reference anything that exists inside the level. So if I put a box trigger here and then go to the uh, to the to the level blueprint, as long as I have if I have that box selected, then I can right-click and create a reference to that box and I can use it like a variable, like any other object in any other blueprint, except it exists in the world, has an actual object that was placed there. So that's a very convenient way and a very convenient place to uh, to, to employ that kind of, um, you know, well, 
specifically for single player sort of world relevant uh, gameplay. And as well as calling it like a variable like this, I should also mention that as long as you have it selected uh, up above this line here, we can also call functions or events. Uh, so we can say on actor begin overlap with a trigger box that's right there in the world and perform calculations on that. You wouldn't have to do it the other way around, like make yourself an actor with a trigger box in it and then, you know, reference it from other objects. You have it all here in the level blueprint. And that's why that's, uh, that's convenient. So uh, I might call it there, guys. I hope I haven't dragged on too far. And I hope this uh, gives you guys a pretty foundational sort of, you know, day one explainer of the, the function, the role, and the, the purpose of each of these shared uh, game objects, just to alleviate any sort of confusion you might have from the, um, you know, from, from, the, um, from these objects, or what each one does, the point of them, that kind of thing. So anyway, uh, thanks for watching all the way to the end. As always, the, the easiest way to get in touch with me is via Discord. There'll be a link down in the description below. Please feel free to support my work, uh, either a one-time donation on PayPal or you can buy something off the Gumroad store. I recommend the second way because you'll get something in return. And I'll hope to catch you guys in the next video. Thanks.